Hello and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May. I'm joined by Michael Buzzy, Randy Olson, Sandra Weber, who's joining us from New York, special guest, author of The Woman Suffrage Statue, a history of Adelaide Johnson's portrait monument at the United States Capitol, and our special guest, also Dr. Carolyn Sparks, who's joining us from the DC area. And this show continues a conversation that we began with Dr. Sparks about her resolve and initiative to raise the statue that we've been talking about by Adelaide Johnson of Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to raise that from the crypt of the Capitol to the rotunda, where it was originally unveiled on February 20, sorry, 15th, 1921, and where it sat for one day, and then it was moved to the Capitol. And Sandra is really the foremost expert on this, the history of the statue, and we're honored to have her join us in this conversation as well. And as she has pointed out in her wonderful book, uh, it really, the statue was designed for the rotunda of the Capitol. And Alice Paul and Adelaide Johnson went into that space and Adelaide Johnson imagined uh, the statue that eventually went in there in 1921. But um, in 1997, it was finally returned to the rotunda. And this is a very long effort and really Dr. Carolyn Sparks is a driving force in that effort. So we ended the last dialogue in 1995 and Dr. Sparks, as we talked about last time, you really wanted to have this moved because 1995 was the 75th anniversary of the 19th amendment. And we also mentioned last time that 1995 was a very important year and moment to actually like do the heavy lifting of moving the statue, so to speak, because the United States Congress became involved. And it was really Senator Ted Stevens, a Democrat from Alaska, who spearheaded that legislative moment. And um, just to briefly review, uh, Caroline, can you can you just remind us again how Dr. or sorry, Senator Stevens became involved? Uh, yes, um, I was introduced. I, I can't remember who referred me to her to one of his legislative aides. I can't remember whether she found us or or she was referred to us and we contacted her. Her name was Sherry Little, um, and. Um, uh, she met with us, and I realized at that point that we had an ally. She was a women's studies graduate from American University, and she had been taught by uh, one of her mentor was a feminist activist or a feminist professor. Um, and I'm sorry that I can't remember her name. It's probably in my files. Um, but that becomes important a bit later. But... Um, uh, Sherry Little then decided that she liked very much what we were doing, and I think it was Barbara Irvine and I that met with her, and she introduced us to a Mr. Stasser, Sasser, who was the head of Stevens' office, and I think Stevens was actually Republican, um, but we would have to check that. Um, and. Um, Stevens agreed to support the move of the statue as a tribute to his mother, who had been a suffragist uh, and had been um, uh, active in getting women the vote. And Alaska, he's from Alaska, which was one of the first states to give women the vote. And he considered that, um, that Alaska had honored women long before some of the more southern states. All of this, all of the states were southern to Alaska, um, and so um, he supported the move from the beginning. He introduced testimony by me and John Meacham into the Senate um, uh, uh, reports, and um, 
and I tried to, from that moment on, we had support uh, to get the statue moved. Um, so he was one of our first supporters. And, and this is after you had formed the 75th anniversary task force, correct? Yes, that was formed um, three years earlier. Yeah. We, I had, um, uh, I had spoken with different people, different women who were in charge of women's organizations and had asked for their support after, um, so actually we were organized as a committee by 1990 because we talked the last time you and I did this a couple of weeks ago, um, we had, um, by 1990, we had all been present in the crypt before the statue making speeches about moving it. So the task force may have been formed that early mm -hmm. because I saw the 75th anniversary of women's suffrage as the opportunity to move the statue. Mm -hmm. And so we worked on it um, from our initial uh, announcement by the Feminist Institute that we were going to move the statue. Mm -hmm. um, it was 12 years before the statue was placed in 97. Right. Yeah. And so as, as I sort of, you know, there, there's a lot of documents to sort through, but um, I think it's from our, the show resources from the last show that we did a couple of weeks ago, as you said, and there is a link on that on the show resources page to an article. I think it's from the Women's History Museum. And um, they talk about the the sort of the the moments leading up to the actual move. Like they don't include 1990, for instance. And um, you and I discussed this that um, crucial to the involvement of some of the the people who join the task force is seeing this poster that was in this the Sewell Belmont house. Um, and this is a poster that that I believe you created for the, the 75th anniversary and the Move the Statues campaign. It's a poster that you've actually shared with me. It's very, uh, has a very vintage feel. <laughs> so it's from a long time ago. But, um, you know, you started getting the word out and you had this campaign and you were doing PR around it. And I think that people saw that and that that is part of the, the story of how Senator Stevens became involved. I don't know if you want to speak to that. No, but I'm curious about what you mean about the National Women's History Museum. There isn't one as far as I know. There's a website. Yeah, there is there is a website. Um, and so, yeah, if you go to our show resources page from um, you know, our last conversation, there is an article um, about the statue and how they see this poster in the Sewell Belmont house. And I'm virtually certain that that must be your poster. <laughs> Well, the, the uh, probability is it says these liberators are in the rotunda and has pictures of men. And then yes. the, uh, the lower half of it has a picture of the suffrage monument in the crypt. It says, guess who's buried in the crypt? Yeah, um, that's the one. But I think that who you're talking about is probably Karen Stasser, who lists herself now as the chairperson of the National Women's Museum. Mm -hmm. But Karen Stasser, um, was the wife of the chief of staff of Senator Stevens. Mm -hmm. And she became involved in the task force activities um, fairly late in the game. Um, uh, and then became um, a friend of Joan Meacham uh, and Elizabeth Chittick, as I recall, who was the current president of the, uh, was the president of the mm -hmm. um, National Woman's Party um, so the the move to have a women's museum came after the placement of the statue. Oh yeah, recall. it didn't exist in right in the day. Right, yeah, that that's clear from from the the archives. Mm -hmm. So we're we're in nineteen ninety five, and you've met with Senator Stevens, and you're right, he was a Republican. My mistake, I apologize. Um, he he introduces a resolution, Senate 
concurrent resolution number 21. You can download the text of this resolution on our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. It's a very short resolution. Um, he introduces it. Uh, I believe it passes unanimously in the Senate and then the House has to vote on it. And there we, we find some, some difficulties. Uh, and so the House resolution, um, do, do you wanna do you want to speak about this, Caroline? Yes, the uh, Senate unanimously uh, passed a resolution to move the statue uh, to the rotunda, but the House um, and the Speaker of the House at the time was of course Newt Gingrich, the House opposed it and so did uh, Senator, I mean, so did Representative Gingrich. Um, he did that, I think, partly uh, as a favor to, um, I think you told me it was George White was his name, who was the, um, had been for some years, the uh, director, the architect of the Capitol. And the, uh, the architect of the Capitol controls a lot of what goes on on Capitol Hill. Uh, the certain territory that, for instance, is, um, uh, the territory for the uh, Capitol Hill police. And so he opposed moving the statue um, and partly because of its weight. Um, and we kept getting um, into these strange conversations about whether the women on the statue were ugly or not. Um, and that came from various quarters, even before 1995. And then again, between 95 and 97, when the statue was finally moved. And um, we had some stock answers because we had students uh, and history students working for us. One of the stock answers when men would call and say, well, these women are ugly. Our answer was, have you looked at Lincoln lately? Um, you know, we don't care what Abe Lincoln looked like. And um, these are the leaders that, that got the vote for half the country. Who cares what they look like? Um, and some of us think they're quite beautiful. But um, so the other standard, we had a stock answer because men would call and say, there's no such word as four mothers. And we would say, well, how did you think you got here? Um, because they were used to hearing the word four fathers, but they were not used to hearing the term four mothers. Uh, so men took umbrage at that. Um, and so these were the kinds of phone calls we got for all the years we were planning this. Um, uh, and including some women who bought into all that, like these women are ugly, um, et cetera. Sometimes the suffrage monument was referred to as women in a bathtub uh, because there are three of them on the statue. And of course, um, we never liked that kind of nonsense. So we see these all these different objections happening, um, and in addition, the um, there's there's objections in the House regarding the cost of moving the statue and who's going to pay for it. And um, it's actually uh, Republican women who object to they they say that they support the move but they don't support uh, funding the move with taxpayer monies and you can um on our show resources page there is a file that has the objection uh from the congressional record i think it is uh, well there are several objections um okay. i found some of them um uh, with um Republican leaders in the House consistently refusing to move the statue, refusing to pay for it. It was going to cost, it says in some of my files, $75,000. I thought it was $85,000, but that doesn't matter. The point is that Newt Gingrich controls this, the funds uh, to move statues uh, in the Capitol building, uh, the architect of the Capitol does, and Newt Gingrich opposed having to spend taxpayer money on it. And so did a lot of the Republican representatives, but that's a that's a pittance. I mean, he's sitting on about three million dollars in the statuary fund, as I recall, mm -hmm. and uh, he could easily have used seventy-five or eighty-five thousand dollars to move that statue. Mm -hmm. I found that just an excuse. 
um, mm -hmm. not to move it. And finally, the House, I think, passed a resolution to use no, no public funds. Yes. Um, there were several different resolutions introduced by Republican women to use no public funds to move the statue. And um, after the um, events of, the, of 1995 with the 75th anniversary of suffrage, um, where I parted company uh, with um, Joan Meacham and Karen Stasser, um, uh, they were eager to raise the money to move the statue. My position on that was that we should not have to do that and that Newt Gingrich would fold uh, in the subsequent coming election because women in Georgia wanted the statue moved. And indeed that's what happened. I mean, Gingrich became a supporter after that election or leading up to that election is my memory of it. But we had a meeting after the uh, 75th anniversary events were over. We had a meeting and um, Joan Meacham and Karen Stasser were very eager to take over uh, the um, leadership at that point. And I said, look, I have been left with $5,700 to pay for the stage and the porta toilets around the, the rotund, um, around the mall. And I'm paying that off as part of the Feminist Institute's contribution. Um, and I'm not going to raise $75,000 more to move the statue. We should just keep pressuring the Gingrich office to move this, and, and uh, Mr. Gingrich to move that statue. And I said to them, look, the 75th anniversary is over, be my guest. Um, and so they went forward and I can't remember what they called themselves. That was before they launched a move after 97 to have a women's museum. Um, and uh, it so they went, the they went ahead, they went ahead and I just concentrated on slowly paying off the $5,700 debt left over from the 75th anniversary events. Yes, and we talked about that last time, the, the porta toilets and, and <laughs> the pooper scoopers for the horses. Um, can't avoid, yeah, I mean, there's so much, you know, symbolism and, and having to deal with that stuff. <laughs> But as I told you, or if I haven't told you, after after the statue was placed in '97, um, I never I never received another bill. Mm -hmm. The bills went away, mm -hmm. and so just as I was thinking, I've got to appeal to these folks to go ahead and pay the rest of the 75th anniversary, the committee, uh, the 75th anniversary committee, um, to pay for these bills mm -hmm. instead of paying them off yourself. Um, just as that, just as I was getting ready to to take action, the bills went away. I never, um, I never received another bill. Amazing. Yeah, and so this, uh, the 1995 resolution that's originally introduced by Ted Stevens, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it fails. The so it's in 1996 that this issue has to be reintroduced. Um, and as I, I read the, the record, it is reintroduced by Connie Morella, who was also the sponsor of it in 1995 in the House. Um, but in 1996, she reintroduces it. And as you said, um, if you compare the two resolutions, the 1995 resolution, which, which went through a couple of amendments, but not really substantive, um, like the amendments later to the Ted Stevens resolution end up specifying the date of August 26, 1995 for the ceremony. And it's there that um, it says it's going to, the rotunda will be used from seven o'clock until four o'clock, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, so you see that specificity in an amendment in 1995 to Senator Stevens' resolution. It doesn't go anywhere um, because of the objections of Newt Gingrich and others in the House. And so you have this reintroduced in 1996 with the stipulation that no federal funding will be used to move the statue. And that resolution does pass. Um, and so resolved that the architect of the Capitol is going to 
move the statue to the rotunda, but uh, I think it's only for a year. Um, I haven't, I haven't, I think Sandra, you spoke about this in an earlier show. So the, if you look at the original resolution, it's very interesting. Um, it's a year and this commission has to be appointed. So Sandra, do you wanna speak about that for a minute? Sure, you, I was just recalling as you, we were going through these details. Yes, there were so many firsts in this process, right? It's, it's the first statue in the Capitol that anybody talked about the person being ugly. That's never been talked about before. Um, it, it's the first time that the public has to pay to move a statue within the building. And now the statue can only remain there for one year. And a commission is going to be established to decide what to do after that. Um, and that commission actually, I don't believe is ever established because in my, in my opinion, once that statue's there, no politician was gonna dare touch it. And the only other piece of art in the rotunda that ever had that stipulation of only being there for one year, there were only two statues, the suffrage statue and the bust of Martin Luther King Jr. Both of which are now still in the rotunda and have been for many years. Say that again. I said both of which uh, yeah. have never been moved since. And, and um, I think that um, the people who are part of the committee for a women's museum um, want the suffrage statue to be the centerpiece for their museum, which I oppose. I think the suffrage monument uh, needs to remain in the Capitol Rotunda. Oh, I would completely agree with you on that point. Um, again, that's what, where the artist wanted it. She designed it with that place in mind. Yes. That's what the contract was for. And yeah, that's where it should stay. Not only that, I'm not sure that we need a women's museum uh, because I think that women's history is intimately tied to everything in this country and that we should not um, move it so that it's all in one place instead of having it throughout all the buildings and the, and the museums uh, on the mall. So I'm not sure that's a good idea at all. I, I, under, I understand where you're going. Um, I, I mean, what is the goal eventually of American history? American history, human rights history. We shouldn't have things like white people's history and black people's history and women's history and Latino history, right? We should have American history, human rights history, but integrating that, right? This is, we're still in the process of that integration. Yeah, and I, this is definitely a topic for another show or two or three, but um, <laughs> I, I, will, I will open it up to the others. I just wanted to just, um, develop this this point about the statue certain people want it may want it to be moved if you look at the resolution that was passed in 1996 i'm reading from it um, it says resolved that the architect of the capitol shall restore the portrait monument and place it in the rotunda of the capitol for one year at which time it shall be moved to a permanent site along with an appropriate educational display as determined by the commission created in section three. So it's this, this legislation requires it to be moved to a, a permanent site, wherever that is. So by the commission, yep. Well, I have a, I have a, I guess a simple question, but I'm wondering if, uh, if Carolyn, you could paint a picture for me about like what exactly the, like the mundane details look like of the task force because when you say that word it could mean so many things and is it like a group of five people is it a group of 30 people and are you guys meeting once a week or stuff like that just like the, the raw a, mundane i i don't have the list with me but we had a group of oh 12 to 15 people who were the core of the um 75th anniversary task force and um, that's because when I started the move and I announced in um, 
85 that we were going to do this. That was at an event. I'm, I was the president of the Feminist Institute and we announced our intent to move the statue. That became broader as it had to be. As things moved forward, um, we had to have more support than just the Feminist Institute. So I remained president of the Feminist Institute and I became the chair of the 75th anniversary of Women's Suffrage Task Force. Um, and the and chair of the Women's Rights March on the 75th anniversary of women's suffrage on August 26, 1995. Um, so there was a core group of people. And the sad part for me, and one of the things that interests me most now that I'm a psychologist, is that um, in the civil rights movement, um, in the women's movement, um, in, in most, um, in any revolutionary movements of the past, um, there's a lot of infighting. And this group knew that. And we sort of swore fidelity to each other, you know, through the task force and that nothing would part us. Um, the places where we abandoned that pledge to each other is most distressing to me even now. And we did pretty well considering, but um, you know, there were small things that happened uh, that, that led to some, some people, you know, opposing others. Um, and I would include um, my separation from Joan Meacham um, and Karen Stasser, to some extent, Elizabeth Chittick. Um, and the task force, there were no open splits, but there were certainly disagreements. Um, one of our committee um, uh, actually opposed moving the statue. And that's that was our sole purpose for being. And she used to harangue us on that topic uh, in meetings, task force meetings, um, and wrote a really scathing article for the Capitol Hill newspaper at one point talking about how ugly these women were. Um, and that was distressing to us all. But um, it's hard to hold a group together and it's not, it has nothing to do with whether it's a group of women or a group of anybody, men, men and women. Um, it's just that people take different tacks as we go along. Um, and I wish that that were not true. So my separation at the end, after the 75th anniversary, where I said, I'm not raising another time <laughs> because I had spent 12 years um, dealing with the funding for moving the statue um, and for, all the, for a lot of the anniversary of women's suffrage, the 75th anniversary events and things like that, I was exhausted and, um, I just turned it over to them. It was one of the best moves I ever made because between 1995 and 1997, that group, and I, somewhere in my files, I would know the name they called themselves. Um, that group got themselves into trouble. They were generally new to the women's movement. They really didn't know the history from 1848 to the present. Um, they, um, they were often interviewed by the press over the issue of Sojourner Truth and a Sojourner Truth statue. And they made a lot of mistakes about that. Um, and there, were, there was this whole discussion of whether she should be added to the back base of the statue. There's a, there's a pillar that, the, that Adelaide Johnson deliberately left uncarved that was supposed to represent the women of the future who would come forward to work for women's rights. Some people wanted the face of Sojourner Truth there um, and uh, that was not originally planned. And as a historian, I thought that was not a great idea. Um, they, they were in the press with um, um, a lot of black women opposing them because they didn't support putting Sojourner Truth on the statue. Um, they did support, as do I, um, a, a statue of Sojourner Truth, um, but, but um, they, they continually sort of stumbled all over themselves when asked about women's history. And I received a call 
probably a year into that um, when they were being attacked in the press a lot, I received a call from a woman from American University. And it turned out that she was Sherry Little's uh, mentor um, in women's studies. And she said to me, she and I talked, she said, I said, I've, I've resigned from this. I mean, I'm not part of that. And she said, I knew there had to be a feminist mind behind moving the statue. And she says, I don't see that operating in this group um, that are being attacked. And part of it was that um, um, some of the women were saying that black women were not in the 75th anniversary march. That's not true. Um, the African-American Women's Clergy Association was in the march. The um, black Women's Agenda group was in the march. One of the large black sororities, Delta Sigma Theta, was all in the march. Um, but they didn't know that. And so they, they couldn't say anything about it. Um, the National Council of Negro Women were in the march. Um, so, and they were supported by, the march was supported by all of the um, women who were in Congress at the time. Uh, um, and so they didn't know their history well enough to even respond. And um, so they continued to argue about this until 97, even when the statue was finally placed. So that's, it's unfortunate um, that um, the sort of true history of the 75th anniversary march was not known by the people who carried on after the, um, the events were over for the 75th anniversary. Um, but at that point, I think that the whole thing has been resolved at this point, because I do think that the most recent um, version of the statue uh, in New York City does have Sojourner Truth as one of the people on the statue. Mm -hmm. It does, but it, it removed Lucretia Mott. So, so instead of four, four the, the original did, three with Sojourner Truth, they, they removed Lucretia Mott. So in, if, you know, Sojourner I'm Truth sure. would, be, would be a fourth individual. Um, uh, conversation. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. I don't, uh, that statue was just recently um, yep, on, the, on the 100th anniversary, right. uh, August 26th of 2020. Yeah. Because of COVID, I haven't been to the city in a long time. Yeah. But uh, so, Randy, does that, that answers your question about the kind of logistics of the task force? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I'm just, you know, I, I was when this when this was all taking place, I was still wearing diapers. Right. So I was just trying to, like, wrap my head around, like, OK, so how many people are involved and like what are some of the, you know, big picture projects that have to take place in the procedure to like actually accomplishing this kind of task that involves legislation and lots of logistics and lots of people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just like, you know, the raw details, I'm, I'm hungry for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Michael, do you have any questions or comments? I do have a question. Thank you. Dr. Sparks, did you ever have a chance to personally interact with Speaker Gingrich about his opposition to the statue? I never had that conversation with Speaker Gingrich. I went to school at Tulane in history. I have a master's degree in history from Tulane when he was there. Um, and um, my former husband and I used to say, wasn't he the guy <laughs> that made beer? He made homemade beer in his garage. And um, he was in American history, peculiarly, since he opposed the <laughs> leaders of the 1848 Women's Rights Committee. Um, but uh, he was in American history, so we didn't know him well. We saw him at student gatherings, but we were we were both in European history at the time. And so um, I never talked to him. I used to call his office and say, and I would get the I would get these kids who were sort of interning at his office, and I would say, you know, tell Speaker Gingrich that this is Dr. Sparks and that we went to school together and that he should know better than to oppose the suffrage monument. And these, these kids would fall all over themselves trying to figure out how to answer me. And um, 
one woman called a woman that we knew who was I think she was a reporter from somewhere like Arizona she she called us one day and she said that she had had that kind of conversation with one of his interns and that the kid had said well I don't know about the statue but I'm sure he supports women's rights to vote and she wrote this hilarious article again somewhere buried in my archive this hilarious article about thank god we should all get down on our knees and and the fact that the speaker of the house supports votes for women so it was quite funny um and i don't know if he realized the extent to which we were trying to reach him or not that is absolutely incredible thank you for sharing <laughs> Sandra, did you have any, any follow-up questions about the task force or any of the details that Caroline has shared? I, mean, I, I have a short list here. There were a whole lot more uh, people uh, uh, and organizations who supported the 75th anniversary, including all the mem member, women members of Congress and of course, Hillary Clinton, um, and um, Hillary Clinton was our honorary chair for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, but here's some examples. Um, besides the African-American Women's Clergy Association, the Alice Paul Centennial Foundation, um, the American Association of University Women, the ERA Summit, um, federally employed women, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the Great Panthers, uh, the League of Women Voters of the US, the League of Women Voters in Virginia, uh, National Abortion Federation, National Committee on Pay Equity, National Council of Negro Women, um, the um, National Women's History Project, uh, National Women's Political Caucus, the Older Women's League, the Susan B. Anthony Suffrage Contingent from New York, uh, from Rochester, New York, where of course that's where she lived. Um, the Women's Bureau of the Department of Labor, the Women's Campaign Fund, the Woodrow Wilson House Museum, and that was just a list of March 1st, 1995, when we were still in formation. Uh, so many other groups joined after that. Um, and um, so we had huge representation from national women's organizations as well as local women's organizations. Hmm. Thanks for that. Sandra? Oh, I just... Um... I just remembered something concerning the uh, the statue moving to the rotunda and it being restricted to only stay there for one year before it was going to be uh, moved permanently to another place. As mm -hmm. you say. So what, what do we mean? But also part of that was that that commission, which never formed. No, the commission was never formed. Yeah. Um, but they were supposed to recommend an alternative statue to be placed mm -hmm. in the rotunda to commemorate the struggle mm -hmm. of women for equal rights. So uh, there was, so that's kind of another, it, so it would have required them to somehow come up with a statute to replace this one, I guess. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was, um, my memory is that that resolution was part of the House of Representatives, not the Senate. Yes, that was part of the House Resolution 216. Yes, yes. And so I'm not sure that that was the final version at all. Um, but you wanted to talk about the events of actually moving the statue. Yes. So yeah. it was finally moved in 1997. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we're, was, we're, we're stuck on 1995 and 96. And um, yes, um, let's talk about the actual move, which happened around Mother's Day. And you were there. So, so tell us what you remember. My memory is that it took a whole weekend. It, the statue was lifted through um, an old elevator shaft. Um, and um, there are many pictures of it. Um, it was all bound up so that it could be raised. Um, it's eight tons of Carrera marble. My memory is that one reason the positioning of the statue was delayed is I think and I have to go back to the crypt and look at it. Um, I think they had to put a special pillar underneath where the statue sits uh, because they were concerned about the floor being able to hold that, um, that weight. And so it sits very near Abe Lincoln 
uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, statue. Um, and I, I think there's a reason for that um, is because they had to support, they had to reinforce the floor. Um, but the statue came up on the other side of the rotunda elevator shaft. Uh, um, and the, the contractor who moved the statue, my memory is it was a women led uh, company and she was there, I don't remember her name. Um, and those of us that had been on the 75th anniversary uh, committee, we laid aside whatever differences had emerged and it was like uh, everyone was there. Um, and it was peaceful and we had a good time. And by that time there was a new younger um, architect of the Capitol who supported the move and was very nice to all of us. Um, and uh, something that probably couldn't happen now with all the security um, is that um, we had champagne to celebrate the move of the statue. Um, he permitted us to have a big party and have pizza delivered to the Capitol. Um, and so at something like two in the morning, my memory is that we, at, when the statue was finally placed, we all celebrated um, the move including the architect of the Capitol and his staff who had stayed throughout and some of the reporters who had stayed and then our members of our commission, um, the 75th anniversary group. And um, it took two days, I think, to roll the statue slowly across the rotunda until its final placement. And um, there is, um, women's history of the move underneath the statue if if uh because they had um they had a mat on the floor as large as the base of the statue <clears throat> and we all placed memorabilia of the move including one of those posters you referred to um and our business cards and all kinds of things underneath the statue that it's flat, of course, everything we put under there was paper and flat things. So there's, there's history there. And um, the statue was then, and then everything was covered by the mat and the statue was slowly, ever so slowly um, raised into position. And um, by that time it was late at night, uh, the end of that weekend, if, if I'm correct. I can't, I haven't found that folder yet, um, but um, in my archives, but um, the statue was lowered and, um, and we formed a circle. I quickly, uh, as, as I realized it was going to be lowered that night um, and not the next day, um, I organized a women's ritual around the statue so that when it was finally placed, everybody there um, I made a circle around the statue holding hands. And I had written a, a, a short ritual where we called the directions uh, Northeast, South and West. And I had scribbled out um, things to say and, and had designated four women and myself. I was in the center of the circle to, to call the directions um, as, a, as a means of sort of placing the statue and hoping that it stayed there forever. Um, and one of the women who um, called one of the directions was Colleen Jenkins, who was Susan uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's great granddaughter or great great granddaughter, I can't remember which. And, um, um, and I believe she took up most of those little papers that I had written out. I think somewhere in my files, I have mine and perhaps one of the others. And I've written to her and asked her if she has those because it would be nice to bring them all back together as part of the history of the move of the statue. Um, and then, as I said, the architect of the Capitol, um, we all broke out champagne and um, toasted the move of the statue um, and the, the, the founders of the women's rights movement from 1848 and had pizza and champagne party with the press and um, the Capitol staff. So it was wonderful fun actually. And I was glad that it ended that way. Um, there was a ceremony later, weeks later, 
um, to that was formal. Um, I was not invited to sit on the podium. Um, I think it was Republicans on the <laughs> on the podium, but I I didn't really care because you have to have any movement has to reach way beyond its roots in order to get something done on a national level. Newt Gingrich made a speech that made it sound like it had all been his idea in the first place. That was a little hard to take. Um, my friend Jackie Gentry, who had been part of all of this, uh, was sitting next to me in the audience, just fur fuming, furious um, that Newt Gingrich had made that kind of speech and that I was not on the podium, which was very loyal and sweet of her. Um, and then there was a reception afterward. And um, it was at that reception that I thought, you know, you have got to approach people one more time about paying off the um, final bills from the 75th anniversary task force. And I didn't say anything. And as I said, since the since the statute was placed, I was never I was never I never received another bill. So I don't know why, but that was a lovely end to the whole thing. And I did receive two calls. I received a call from Barbara Irvine uh, thanking me for all the work. And um, I received a call from Sherry Little um, thanking me for everything I had done. I didn't receive a call. I ran into her about three years later. A young woman approached me in a restaurant when I was sitting with some colleagues from George Washington University. And she said, you're not gonna remember me, are you? And that was Sherry. And she thanked me very much. And um uh that was lovely to hear amazing and and actually that later formal ceremony that you referred to that was in june um i think it's june like june 26th and there is a c-span archive of that we have put it on our show resources page from a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. so if you want to see that that formal ceremony and yeah you can see newt gingrich gives his speech they have a Frederick Douglass impersonator as well, I noticed. Uh, so it's a, it's, um, and they, they march out with the original banners of the National Women's Party. So yeah, a lot of formalities to that, right. to that, and to that one, but yep. And for the 75th March, we also mm -hmm. had used the original banner mm -hmm. uh, from the National Women's Party. And um, we had impersonators of Susan B. Anthony. I have a picture of my mother and my godmothers uh, standing with the woman who was playing Susan B. Anthony <laughs> and um, several others. Um, so we tried to have fun when we could, <laughs> let me say. Um, we also had an event at the Lisner Auditorium at GW uh, because by that time I was teaching at GW. Um, an event before the march, I think the night before, and Hillary Clinton had sent remarks, you know, had sent a video of her remarks and supporting the move of the statue. I think I have a copy of that somewhere, um, but right now I haven't looked enough to find it. Right, so this, so the statue is finally moved in 1997. You're there at both the, the sort of actual movement of it and mm -hmm. the formal ceremony. and. Um, did you continue the feminist walking tour and were you able to continue that and, and tell this more recent history? Um, no, by that time I had gone to GW. Um, I had spent 12 years on the issue of moving the statue. And as I was riding my horse down Pennsylvania Avenue at the head of the um, march, I thought, you know, by that time I was what 52 years old um, and I thought this is my swan song um, I have to leave this to younger feminists at this point and so I haven't been too active um, since um, the whole effort practically bankrupted the feminist institute which was a fairly small organization to begin with um, and um, and the walking tour ended. I, the, the walking tour, I had established the walking tour mostly to bring attention to women's history on the Hill. And by, this, by the time the statue was moved, um, I don't think we did that. The only thing I did subsequently, and I have pictures of that event, was for the 85th, 10 years later, for the 85th anniversary, 
um, uh, with a, a group of, of um, uh, people who had supported the, the move of the statue. And um, uh, someone from GW was with us. The women from the American uh, Psychological Association were with us. Um, and um, I'm trying to remember the person from uh, who was representative from Rochester at the time. She sponsored us um, and we had pictures of one of her aides um, and we presented um, a huge wreath uh, on a stand in front of the uh, statue uh, commemorating uh, 85 years of women getting the vote. And uh, the wreath was in suffrage colors. We were in suffrage colors. We were wearing uh, purple, yellow, purple, gold, and um, white. Um, we still had our banners from the march, you know, that were in suffrage colors. And um, so it was fun. And we presented a st the statue. And I assumed at the time that the statue, we had received reports that the statue had become quite popular. And at that point, it was, it had become part of the regular tours of the Capitol building. But you and Sandra have said that by the time you saw it in the 2000s, um, after that, and that would have been, uh, the 85th anniversary would have been what, um, 2005? Um, that you all weren't allowed, it was not on the Capitol tour and that you all tried to stand there in front of it and that you were removed. I mean, the Capitol police said you had to move on. And so I'm sorry that, I'm sorry to hear, and I think we should do something about it, mm -hmm. that the statue doesn't seem to be on the regular tours of the Capitol building. And, um, and, I would like to think that the history of the statue was being adequately represented um, uh, and because otherwise they wouldn't know the history of it necessarily. So it'd be interesting if um, we tried to see that it's, it's appropriately a part of the tour. Um, because when I, in the days when I was doing the feminist walking tour and we always ended up down in the crypt saying this statue has to be moved. Um, I would sit, I think I said that in our last podcast, I would just sometimes sit and watch women and their daughters approach the statue and have no idea who these women were. Um, even if they could see the names of the women on a plaque next to the statue, they didn't know the history of it. Like why were they being represented in this huge statue? Um, and so we do need women's history to be incorporated into the whole history of the United States. Um, Sandra, you wanted to speak about your seeing the statue and it's not being part of the uh, regular tour. Oh, uh, yes. I went in there several times on different tours and it seems like they were leaving it up to the tour guide to decide what to talk about in the rotunda because there are you know so many pieces of art in there and so it it seemed to be left up to the tour guide to decide you know which two or three things to point out in the rotunda and your tour guide did they ever point out that statue no yeah nor did nor did ours <laughs> so. that's really incredible i mean that they don't realize the significance of honoring these three women who first called for women to get the vote and worked on it all of their lives. Um, and um, that that's not mentioned on the tour that, um, I mean, the, the key figures are all men and they're still, is that what they talked about on the tour? the men's statues? I don't, I wasn't paying attention. Me neither. <laughs> I went over to the, the suffrage statue. <laughs> uh, say the same. I think they talked about the ceiling and yeah, some painting yeah. on the ceiling. Yeah, go ahead, Randy, you were there. Yeah, our, our tour guide was very much interested in describing every single component of the ceiling. Hmm. 
Well, we used to refer on the tour, we used to refer to George Washington surrounded by all these half nude goddesses as George and the girls, you know, so we, we had a different tour. We had a different view of the Capitol Rotunda. And the only, that's, so the only pictures of women um, up in the top of the rotunda is, as I said, George and the girls. And then uh, there's a huge painting of, um, I think it's Pocahontas getting married in a Western white wedding gown, um, which I doubt I was the yeah. case um, uh, because it wouldn't have fit the proper, it wasn't the proper attire for weddings at the time. Um, and um, that's it. I mean, that's why we wanted the <laughs> suffrage monument, which liberated half the country uh, to be there. And the fact that they're not even mentioning these women on the tour is just astonishing. Um, and if I could jump in for a second. I, and I think the other part of that is, is, is you know, the resolutions is, you know, there was planned to be some kind of educational display put there with the statue or the inscription was going to be restored. And neither of those things really happened because no one could agree on the wording of what, you know, a, a display should be next to it. And all that could ever be agreed to was to put the names next to it. Wow. I mean, <clears throat> So this is, it's still a work in progress and it's something that, you know, perhaps we can all contact our representatives and ask them to yeah, take up this, because we're, we're coming on the 100th anniversary of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment introduction. And I think it's 1923, Sandra, is that? Well, I noticed that in one of my documents of all the women from uh, Congress who signed on as sponsors of moving the, um, if I look at this list here, it includes um, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, U.S. House of Representatives. So we could start there, mm -hmm. um, or and or approach the women who represent New York. Uh, certainly, who, whoever is the current person who represents Rochester, mm -hmm. uh, New York, and see if they would help us uh, be sure that the history of the uh, of the statue is mentioned on um, Capitol building tours. Yeah, and I, and I just wanna say, I mentioned this, I think the, our last show, or if not in a, in a private conversation, but um, in 2013, the first ever statue of a woman was placed in the Peace Palace in The Hague. I was there for that and very much involved in that. And that statue was Bertha von Suttner. And it's the same thing. I mean, she's not included on the tour um so, so it's not, it's not on the tour. no and so she's like it's like her like her her book is is part of the reason why czar nicholas ii called the 1899 hague peace conference she was really like the leader of the of the peace through law movement and she's so important and i'm just pointing out like it's not it's not unique to um to the capital tours that i think there's there's, you know, this education has to be continuous and aggressive and, and it's not, there's really not a lot of education about Bertha von Suttner. Um, so we do what we can with, yeah. with these podcasts and, and I, I'm, I'm still learning. So there's a lot to be done. Um, anybody else on this, the, the, the tour is not including the statue or that, that bit, anybody else? going once. And Hope and Randy, you were both forcibly removed from the front of the statue, is that correct? <laughs> Indeed. Well, yeah. Yeah, we uh, we had the, you know, audacity to try to take a picture holding a peace flag, and they thought that that was uh, unacceptable. So, because we were trying to sort of, you know, have a photo connecting these stories, because mm -hmm. like the, the history of the peace movement and the history of the women's movement are obviously very connected and in the process of trying to concretize that memory in a photograph yeah the the uh the men with guns decided it was time for us to leave and uh i try i i tried to appeal to reason it didn't work and I, I also want to you know point out uh the colors of the peace flag are this same as the suffrage colors they're the same colors 
And that's a, an important linkage, um, purple, white, and gold. And the peace flag is 1897 and the National Women's Party colors in 1913. So the peace flag predates um, the National Women's Party flag. And so yeah, this conversation for another day, but yeah, that's what we were trying to do. And we had the, the um, instruction. Well, and these women, these women were also abolitionist leaders. And, and as we pointed out, and I think we're going to point out in our next conversation, the, the, the individuals leading the ceremony where the, the statue was unveiled in 1921 were Jane Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is right at the end of, of World War I. So it's 1921 and war was very much on the minds of people. And, and Sarah Bard Field, um, a note like she's no, she explicitly leaves the National Woman's Party because they decide not to work for peace. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are the two uh, leaders of the of the ceremony. And I think that's really striking that these are the, the individuals there at the unveiling of why them. Um, and so conversation for another day. Uh, we're just going to move on because we're sort of closing in on on the end of the the dialogue but um so as you said you really like at this point um you stopped doing the feminist walking tour and um you you went to go teach it at gw and as you shared with us last time like you're, you're retired now but you have this new venture which is about promoting wellness, your health concierge. We did put a link on our show resources page of last week's show. So check out yourhealthconcierge.com. And, and you're, you know, you're focused on wellness and I see a linkage between what you did before and what you're doing now. And I'm just wondering if you, you, if you see connections and you're, you know, you're a psychologist, you see connections between history, like knowing history and, and wellness. Um. Well, we're doomed to repeat our mistakes unless we change how we operate with one another. And now that I've been a psychologist for 50 years, um, the issue, one of the issues for me is we are all in a sense victims of our, of our culture at the time that we live. And that our culture um, in the United States has increasingly um, been less peaceful in recent years mm -hmm. and that uh, part of how we're all affected men and women are by toxic notions of um, what it means to work together the fact that children in the United States um, are less cooperative with one another than uh, people in other countries uh, many other countries um, the whole notion that we have entered wars since World War II um, that have um, killed a whole lot of people um, on all sides. Um, all of this is distressing to me. And the fact that if we continue, if we cannot figure out how to operate from a wellness standpoint, um, that once again, we are doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that there, that the connection has led me toward what would be my sort of, because I'm now 77 years old, toward my last hurrah and my last effort to establish um, cooperation and peace among people mm. um, by looking at things from a wellness perspective. And by wellness, uh, my company, for instance, uh, your health concierge, is building out an eight dimensional model of wellness that includes all the aspects of our lives. Um, not just people uh, who come for emotional assistance with therapy, um, but um, different ways. And we have a center for wellness training um, so that we can begin to understand um, what kind of, be of change we need. And as a professor in charge of health promotion in the School of Public Health for 25 years at George Washington University, um, the courses that I developed, including public health advocacy, had to do with how can we 
continue to move forward in the spirit of wellness? And how can we create behavior change um, that leads toward peace, happiness, and frankly, joy in our in living? And um, and so that's where I have come to late in life. And this is a company that I started with a team of graduate students at GW who went into the GW business competition and got into the top 10 and we won an award for the concept of a wellness center and we've been building it out ever since and um, it means that we have to treat each other in uh, um, loving manners the same way that we try to treat clients mm -hmm. and um, I can only hope that the sort of you know, we pride ourselves on being a company that leads with love. And to me, that's a certain kind of energy mm -hmm. that encourages people to be well and to um, move forward in peace with each other um, and create happy lives. Um, and we shall see. Uh, but this is, this is where I have been called to action, I think, at this point in my life. It's really cool, you know, and, and when you talked about the connection between history and wellness, you know, you, you focused on we're doomed to repeat things, you know, the awful history if we don't understand it. And we also should aim to repeat good history. And so that's what we try yes. to do. Um, and we're, I'm very much influenced by positive psychology. Um, and so from that, uh, I, I use this phrase positive history. I think I mentioned it last time. And your, you know, your story, the story of this statue, as I interpret it, is one of positive history. Yes. And, and I, I tried to say this last time that at least psychologically or emotionally, and, and maybe Sandra can speak to this as well, because the story of the statue obviously <laughs> called to Sandra to you know, write a book on it when she stumbled upon it in a footnote. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this psychologically, there's something about um, the need to belong. There's something about being a part of a narrative, uh, what, what's called a redemptive, redemptive narrative. These stories of movements and the details in them, I think it's very, very therapeutic to come into contact with them and to learn the details and and so, Caroline, that's why you're here to talk mm -hmm. about the details of your story, um, which I find fascinating, inspiring, uplifting. I've had a very difficult week, and hearing you talk about this, yeah, helps helps my mood very much. So I thank you for that, and I I see what you what you did before with the feminist walking tour is absolutely. Yeah, a part of wellness because you're exposing people to these stories that help them have a sense of belonging and you're also pointing to characters from history that model virtues and i think that's really really important um i don't know if sandra you want to talk about you know your for 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 